Or, what is the, oh, the PT Cruiser? PT Cruiser? From, uh, Thunder Mifflin company car. Oh, the Sebring? Yeah, but at one point he has a PT Cruiser, the one where he's like, it's Britney, bitch. I'm oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but also the Sebring. <laughs> Welcome <laughs> to And That's Why We Drink Studios. What if we just did a, just sat here <laughs> silently for a little bit? That sounds good. I feel like we do that anyway by accident. Uh, hello, it is 3.30. We got here at 11.30. Um, <laughs> we ended up eating a lot of pasta. We, ended we up talking. literally sat there and went, well, we should probably, for the sake of this show, we should feed ourselves mm -hmm. first. Ordered a bunch of pasta. We and also with the last few uh, weeks, we've been like really good about like getting things done so quickly. <laughs> Usually we're done by now, and now we're just beginning. We we got cocky and thought, oh look how good we are at time management. I had a feeling last night. I was like, tomorrow's gonna be a long day. You literally planned for it. Um, also, I'm I didn't wash my hair, so I'm wearing this hat, but it keeps like. How do you do it? Oh, I guess yours is to the side. You just gotta learn. You gotta learn the the ropes. I'm smacking You're my still hat too green into the microphone uh how are you you oh. where what have you been doing oh man i'm great i went to visit my family in cincinnati looked at some spaceships i feel really bad because um somebody this lovely young woman recognized me at the museum and my sister was making like laughing because i don't think she's ever seen me yet recognized anywhere and i feel like i looked kind of deer in the headlights and all yeah. i said was i have to go tell my mom and then I like, walked away. And so I, if to you, I didn't even ask what your name was. And I'm so sorry. And uh, hello to you. And thank you for all the wonderful work you do at the Cincinnati Museum Center. The weirdest uh, way that I've been recognized so far, it wasn't that I was recognized in a weird way, but the weirdest experience was that I was being recognized in front of Deirdre. Oh, And right. it was weird to see my friend see me being recognized. That happened with Renee. And my best, like, you, I know it's my best friend's feeling. thinking, like, why on earth do you give a shit about this person? <laughs> but I oh, guess. To, uh, like, like, not about, to you. No, like, like saying it uh, to them about me. Right. Like, why would you possibly? Well, I don't get it. The worst was <laughs> when this happened when on my birthday weekend when Renee was visiting me. And Renee ordered tequila shots at, like, 10 in the morning. And we were, like, <laughs> just having the time of our lives. And then two hours later. We asked our server for the check, and she's like, by the way, are you Christine Schieffer? And I was like, no, you can't do this three hours after watching me take tequila <laughs> shots at 10 in the morning. Um, so anyway, hello to you, too. Uh, thank you. Uh, how are you doing, Em? I'm fine. I'm sleepy because we just ate a lot of carbs. I truly, though, I got this nice little uh, fancy so soda. We now uh, are trying to uh, be hip with the youths. So we both got TikTok. Mm. We're not doing anything with it, to be clear. We're, we're not like we're staring at it and laughing. Acting. Uh, do they act? Do they perform? Uh, we're not trying to be TikTok stars. They dance a lot. I definitely don't do that. We just are now involved in it and understand why other people are obsessed. We get the teens now suddenly. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Em sent me a TikTok yesterday and I thought this is the final straw. I'm going to download this thing. And I was with my sister all week and she just was showing me things that were so nonsensical um i kind of get half of them it's now though. fun though yeah i feel like i'm back in the loop we're youthful once again finally finally um but yeah that's all that's going on with me uh i probably have a patron of the week so you say something while i find oh. that hmm uh alice and i went to an escape room and it was uh harry potter themed oh, and that's fun it was fun because they didn't have any of the license to uh, like any of the trademarks or copyright no! to say anything about harry potter so everything was like one letter off so it was Perry Hotter themed. Yeah, it was like you could be like you were in Gaffendor and and <laughs> oh my like God. and uh, <laughs> Slitherus and like oh my God. everything was kind of off. Like Snape was Znape and what the hell? It was like knockoff Harry Potter escape room, and we did it by ourselves, and we actually won. I was like we beat it. I was surprised. Oh, I'm so I'm not surprised. Why are you surprised? I'm surprised because You're she the was king of escape rooms. Yeah, she's not. I she, oh Allison. Allison yeah. was my guinea pig for. Uh, to, before I showed Christine her escape the room lemon, that I made. Lemonscape room. Allison did not even come close to winning on time. God. It, so I thought, oh boy, I'm going to have to carry the, carry this uh, this team here. But she actually probably was carrying me. We did a good job. Teamwork. Um, uh, sorry, found the patron of the week. It's two people, Kara and Richard. Oh. Thank you, Kara and Richard. Uh, a little duo there. A little duo. Uh, thank you so much for your support. Yeah. 
It's uh, gl- glad to glad to have you. Glad to have a, a duo. You should probably make separate accounts and pay us each separately. You could duet. That that's would... a TikTok thing I've heard. Oh yeah, I did see that hashtag on there. That would uh, double our income on uh, your behalf. Yes, I'm just kidding. Don't I'd do say that. So. Oh, but thank you, Karen Richard. I appreciate it. But do it. But do um, it. So that so i don't know what else to say my toes are a little cold it's a little chilly here yeah it's pretty chilly in february in los angeles about 65 degrees out can you believe it? it's piping cold (laughs) freezing (laughs) Uh (laughs) my toes need socks and that's that's how cold it's gotten recently um okay so my story i have wanted to do for a while okay um i'm actually glad in hindsight that i didn't do it um back when i planned on it which was a few months ago i was kind of overwhelmed with the uh information on it and that there's a lot of not necessarily twists and turns but the story got changed a lot over time and so it was kind of hard to keep up on where everything actually fit into the story but now that you have tiktok you can really keep up honestly now i'm like i'm scared that i found something else i'm addicted to on the social media in the social media field because uh I got TikTok maybe three days ago, and I don't think I've done anything else. Truly, Em and I sat here. We were like, we should probably record for a bit before our food gets here. We and then on TikTok. Half hour of full silence punctuated by. <laughs> like, well, truly. I got into it because RJ, my roommate, got into TikTok. And then he told me later, but he was like, oh, I did TikTok. And then he was like, three hours later, I had to like get rid of TikTok because I was so consumed it with it. It will suck you right in, I tell you what. The worst part is the algorithm. It figures out what uh-huh. you like, so the videos get better, so you become more addicted to it. It's a nightmare tried to show me some anatomy crap and i was like don't show me the inside of my muscles i'm gonna throw up oh oh i'm sorry the mail is here please uh please hold please cut this out eva is it the smell of cardboard (laughs) in taxes if it were the smell of cardboard in my home would be just a haven of (laughs) dog anger no uh so what i learned fun fact everyone is that uh dogs they if they learn to bark when there is an intruder coming at their space like say a mail carrier um it's reinforced every time because this person walks up to the house and leaves oh. and they're barking and so they learn like oh if i bark really loudly They'll go this away. person will walk away just like a delivery person etc and so um i was really good the first year and a half with geo of like avoiding that scenario but now that we live somewhere with windows right to the front of the house lost cause man i'm sorry for you so sorry sorry for you people with your ears um really sorry for eva for having to edit out the worst parts of it oopsie um okay so back, we, back to you back to me back to reality so um oh there goes gravity <laughs> mom's speedy. speaking of gravity <laughs> did you try the broom thing yesterday no i didn't try it yet i don't know where my broom is i have a dyson does that work yeah it definitely balances upright mm-hmm. <laughs> it actually does and i hurt myself a lot with it well before people freak out apparently it's like a it's a like a like it's, it's, it's not like real. A, a meme yeah it come it shows up like every couple of years like people forget about it just long enough for you to be able to do it again and mm-hmm. pretend it's this new thing so before people tweet me a million times saying it's fake okay we're here. wait what's fake oh they think it's like a ghost or something no it's that um nasa they say that nasa says this is the only day where the gravity wait what oh i did not know about that part i just did thought you everyone... think people were just balancing their brooms? yes i did and i thought how stupid is this there was a reason for it but apparently it like it's a thing that's going to happen in another couple years and people are going to forget that we did it but it's not time. a thing apparently it's not a thing i'm being told do it's not a brooms thing. just do that i think so and we just never try because every time you have a broom you just lean it against the wall this is the weirdest thing. Okay, I thought it was just everyone's like, cool, broom stand up. I was like, yeah, okay. No, it's supposed to be like a NASA announced something. But anytime you, I looked it up yesterday, it was like, oh, the broom challenge is back. And it's like, okay, well, it sounds like <laughs> the it's... broom challenge. That's why I thought it was just people standing brooms up. I was like, the broom challenge sounds super dumb. No, apparently it's it's a thing that happens every now and then, so. All right. Um, Remember that cool Roomba Ouija board meme? <sighs> Don't. <laughs> Just, if you're guys if you're listening please stop sending us that picture we've seen nobody it. sends it anymore and when what are they, you talking about i still get do, it sent all people the time lose their minds because they get so angry and i'm like dude this person doesn't know <laughs> what happened they don't know the, the the big chaos of 2018 or 2019 where our facebook group the almost slacked floor that it, someone like went and painted a ouija board on their floor and then they had a roomba mm-hmm, like that looks like a demon that looks like the pendant or the what's it called i don't know no they it basically just says pen champ 
pet chat? Nope. Leave me alone. Plan chat. Uh, but no, it says like, oh, I'm going to summon a, my Roomba's going to summon a demon. And like, it was funny for a second. And then like 4,000 people shared it to the point where the mods of our old Facebook group had to create a rule. Like you are no longer allowed to share this <laughs> and it will be deleted. And it caused so much chaos that now it's like the fucking broom challenge. Every like six months, one poor person who's new to the group will say, guys, have you seen this? And the world just loses their minds. It's it's always fun because like you can tell like when there's like a new slew of people who just started the podcast because we get sent all Mm -hmm. the stuff that the people six months ago. Whale noises. uh, Which is, I mean, we appreciate. Obviously, it's hilarious. I love it. It's just like we all of a sudden get this influx of tweets about whale noises. And we're like, well, I guess a whole new (laughs) group of people are listening now. Um, welcome. This is your hazing ceremony. Every day there's a new person who finally gets to the lemon episode. Uh-huh. It's- I finally understand lemon. I'm like, your life must have been real weird the last two months. <laughs> you must have not known why we post lemons everywhere. Oh. Okay, so sorry. I'm trying to get to this goddamn sorry. story. I'm sorry. Do you mind? No, I do, actually. Yeah, go so, ahead. <laughs> so uh, this story, I was saying I'm glad that I didn't actually cover it a while ago because I recently actually experienced the story what could that mean is it an alien <clears throat> no i'm waiting not for the day you get abducted oh shit okay. i won't be here you'll be recording that's alone. exactly why i can't wait <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, so, make that a meme tiktok so, <laughs> so sorry i'm we also don't really understand tiktok no. that clearly <laughs> can like, you tell <laughs> we were just watching the office and we heard the theme song and we were like that'd be a good tiktok and hey, it's like don't give my idea away i'm doing something with that <laughs> don't you dare steal that that's fine okay tm 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 tm, TM. so oh, god damn it i'm kidding that was we a didn't surprise. say that at all that was a surprise uh so i am covering the story of the minnesota Iceman. so what this is a cryptid um and it's uh when I say I have recently come in contact with it, I will get to that a little bit later. I have ex- I have had a run-in with the Minnesota Iceman. What could that mean? That's, Christine's confused. No, like, tell me right now. I'll tell you in, like, a good half an hour, however long this usually takes. TikToks are 90 seconds, so I think we should make these episodes 90 seconds to I fit in. I actually bet someone would love that. Yeah, like 15-year-olds, probably. <laughs> we should probably get on it. So uh, Eva would love it. Someone teach us how to make a TikTok podcast, and we'll be the first to do it. A tech pod. If you nope. keep giving away all of our freaking ideas, um, you are the worst. I am TMing all of this. Don't you dare. I will sue. She's you- talking to everyone that's about to tweet this out and make their own thing. We we just said this. So if we find something that's dated later, I we know you heard this. I don't this. know how to sue anybody, but I'm going to learn. <sighs> I'll Google it. The Minnesota Iceman is a uh, cryptid, almost like a Bigfoot creature um, that was found frozen in a block of ice and is allegedly... It could be the missing link in human evolution between <gasps> ape and man. Stop. Now I'm excited. And uh, here's a fun fact. Uh, there are two songs written about the Minnesota Iceman. There are metal songs, naturally, <laughs> okay. called Where is the Minnesota Iceman? And The Minnesota Iceman Cometh by the bands Impaler and Tro- Troglodyte. Great. <laughs> here's another We fun. also understand heavy metal very well. <laughs> I actually am like really into metal music no i'm not i'm kidding i was like wow this is a new fun fact about you i'm into broadway and doo-wops from the 50s actually That's, so that part's true so uh here's another fun fact the minnesota iceman has been featured on several television shows including shipping wars uh <laughs> i was waiting for that because i thought christine would enjoy it i did a little head tilt like geo does <laughs> I was like, what is that sound? uh mysteries at the museum love and unsolved mysteries oh classic so uh here we go i'm gonna try this out for you let me know how it goes do it but only see the nice things to me so in the late 50s to the early 60s the quote ice man there's a few theories as to the how this ice man was found um like i said there are different uh stories over time that came out so i really we don't know what the proper one is but here are Two of the most common ones. Excuse me. So the Iceman was found for sure in a warehouse in Hong Kong. But how it got there, um, it said that either the Iceman was found in the Bering Sea. Did mm-hmm. I say that right? You did. I always get so goddamn nervous. We all know no, I'm no, no. so bad you at said it right. basic geography. <laughs> um, by a Russian sealing ship, but Chinese authorities confiscated it once the ship docked in China. They're so, like, what's this ma- block of ice filled with a man? Like, what's this iced up gorilla? Like We're going to take it. Corpse. 
And so, so that's one theory. Another is that it was found in Hong Kong because it was discovered floating by a Japanese whaling outfit, and then it was sold to an exporter in Hong Kong where it stayed stored wow. in the warehouse. So from the warehouse, the Iceman was then sold potentially and most likely to a wealthy American collector. Sounds about right. Fun fact, the anonymous wealthy owner of the Iceman is widely rumored to be Jimmy Stewart. What? We cannot confirm, but we all believe. But we also will not deny. For those of you who are not watching YouTube and listening to the audio, I am cleaning my glasses, which means I'm blind and cannot read my notes. So, Fun. Christine, riff. I love this idea of becoming a wealthy American collector who just, like, <laughs> buys corpses of of potentially cryptid animals and just is like, this is mine now. One day, if you and I just make bank and like we can just slowly collect like we'll be like the cryptid zach bagans just slowly collecting weird creatures for different if, parts of my mansion if rick and kara finally double up on that patreon donation you heard it here first folks <laughs> so i hope uh, that's their names i just tried to remember <laughs> uh yeah that would be let's pinky swear it but tm you can't do the same thing can you imagine we if we had a cryptid tiktok get out of here tm 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 em, i swear to god em you are literally giving away every good idea we don't have any more. That's it. Those were all, That's all three all of them. That's all ideas. It took us a long time to find all three, and I just said them <laughs> in five minutes. So, uh, yeah, so the the owner may or may not be Jimmy Stewart, although it is widely accepted. Apparently, there's a lot of um, cool. evidence that suggests that. So for the rest of the story, just pretend it's Jimmy Stewart. Oh, I will. So it now enters this man named Frank Hansen. Frank is the main character of this story, by the way, not the Minnesota Iceman. So Frank, he was actually... Uh, I. <laughs> I'll relay this later. Um, I'll, like, I'll, I'll kind of explain how I know this, but this is actually kind of harder to find on the internet. This is something that I, in the middle of my personal experience, I learned this information. Oh my God, I'm just dying to know. So uh, Frank was actually, up before he had his encounter with the Minnesota Iceman, he was traveling around the area in his tractor trailer and he was charging 10 cents to the public for them to see uh, depending on the story, either the smallest or the oldest John Deere tractor in history. He had it <laughs> He had it in the back of his trailer, and he would charge people a dime to go into his trailer and just like get to look at it and then walk away. And that the was his business. The smallest or oldest? We don't know which? We don't know. Could I, it be both? The story I heard was smallest, and then I tried to look it up later online, and in Frank's obituary, it says something about him trying to show off the oldest. Because the oldest is more impressive, because, like, okay. Let's say oldest. Let's say the oldest. Because smallest, I have that, personally. You you gave it to me when you proposed. That's a fact. On a bracelet. And that also took a lot of hard work to find, because let's not forget, I actually bought you, like, a tractor-sized tractor. You did. Because From I Amazon. couldn't find... Well, um, the, no, it wasn't that you couldn't find it. It's that you misread uh, centimeters and inches and feet somehow. And, the uh, picture on the internet made it look small because it was in it's the a, size of my hand. Because it's a thumbnail. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know what? You're lucky that someone's willing to buy you a tractor and then another one. Uh, okay. Oh, trust me. I'm fully on board with that. I don't have the oldest, though, and I'm a little bit salty about that. Okay. I'll... Someday. Hold on to it for longer than any other tractor that's ever existed. <laughs> that's and one day you'll have the oldest. When the earth inevitably just corrodes everything yep, else. Implodes. I'll keep my bracelet. So Frank was known to travel around and show a tractor in his trailer. Okay. And that's when this eccentric Californian millionaire uh, showed up one day and he was like, hey, Frank, I've got something better that you'll probably want to show people instead of that tractor. And then he shows Frank the Minnesota Iceman. Mm. And he hires Frank to care for it because he's like, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> he's like, I bought it because I'm fucking rich, but I don't know how to take care of a giant ape man covered in ice. You don't? And so Frank was now like, OK, so I'll be your agent. He literally would refer to himself as his agent. Great. So he was the agent between the owner and the Iceman. So he would look after the Iceman, kind of keep the wealthy owner updated. And he, now instead of charging 10 cents for people to see this tractor, he was now charging people a quarter, 25 cents. Oh, man. To see this Minnesota Iceman. Although he was not called that yet. He was just called uh, a few different things. Um, I'll read those off in a second. But uh, let me just describe really quick what the Iceman looks like because, as I said, I've seen him. So. I can't believe you've seen him. So he is still today encased in glass. Um, probably... But not ice. 
I meant ice. This, oh, oh, oh. One, I was, the, I was the clear thing that's made of water. I, I didn't mean, I was not calling you out. I was like really curious. I didn't mean. No, I just did that thing where my mom says gas station instead of grocery store. I just assumed everyone was following my, my weird brain. Ice. Ice. Got it. Okay. Um, that's cool though. Yes. Uh, and so it looks like uh, some version of a Sasquatch. It's a very, very, very hairy humanoid creature that's probably it looks like eight feet tall oh um so he is currently in ice slash glass <laughs> slash the grocery store um <laughs> or the post office <laughs> <to say. laughs> and uh so you can t- so his right arm is kind of covering his groin and his <laughs> le- his crotch and his left arm is kind of going in front of his face so it's covering part of it's covering part of his face if so it's sense. like he turned around and saw us, uh, somebody standing there was like, oh, wait, no, yeah, don't he look looks at me. Scared. Don't yeah. look at me or my privates. <laughs> Please don't. Oh, God. It looks like he's covering his crotch and then part of his face. Um, so you can see the outside of one of his hands. You can see the inside of one of his hands, Whoa. which is interesting. Um, you can see how hairy he is. You can see his toes and his fingers are kind of ape-like. Sorry. Christina didn't close the window. It's okay. It's because that's why my toes are so cold. Okay, so. It's probably warmer out there. It actually probably is. Um, Sorry. Okay. Every time I think, this will work. It's fine. It'll do. There won't be a siren this day. Okay. (laughs) So sorry. I'm back. So you can see his, like, his uh, toes and his fingers, and they're very ape-like. You can see there's, uh, it looks like there's almost, like, a, a couple wounds on him. So it looks more humanoid because it's not perfect. Sure. Um, oh, what, because humans are perfect? I am. Well. Um, you can also see that his mouth is open, and the teeth are kind of bananas. They uh, are very, like, square and large. Um, pretty crazy. So yeah. it's very, it's, it. it ape slash man which is why they think it might be the missing link so um in 1966 that's when frank started taking uh the ice man out on the road and he was displaying it at fairs and carnivals still in ice but was showing off like you know pay a quarter and you can come look in the back of my truck because it was never on display like on a stand or upright for people to look at you always had to go into his tractor trailer and then you would kind of just It was lying horizontally, so you kind of start at its feet by the time you got in the tractor trailer, and you could just look over to the side of the fixture he was in, and you could look into the glass and and see the Iceman. Um, And so he was referring to it as a lot of names. He was testing out what to call it on the road. Definitely uh, not politically correct today but it was at, oh. originally called the oriental mystery oh dear god i'm sorry i that was what what it was originally called it was also called the cyber Sci, cyberski creature s-i-b-e-r-s-k-o-y-e creature oh like like siberian yeah but i don't i don't know how to pronounce yeah, the don't, specific I don't word i don't know and uh the creature in ice and so it eventually, thank God, he chose the creature in ice. Yeah, that's right. The Holy tamest, shit. The tamest of all. <laughs> wow. I really, like, I felt gross saying those. Okay. So anyway, he said the creature in ice. Um, and so he started painting um, different, like, uh, like uh, I guess, banners and signs saying, like, come meet the creature mm. in ice. And uh, so many people start hearing about this thing when you knew the next carnival or the next fair was coming into town, you would hope that he would be there to show you cool. the creature in ice. And so a lot of people obviously into cryptozoology and things like that were really interested. Mm-hmm. And so there was one naturalist, his name was Terry Cullen, and he went to go see the Iceman in Chicago. And uh, he actually knew other cryptozoologists who were now considered experts at the time. His name, one of his name was Ivan Sanderson. The other, his uh, last name was Huel, Huelvman, Huelvman, Huel, I always Huelvman. Get, I always get nervous. You show me. I don't know. Huelvman, it looks like. Okay, Huelvman. So there's two guys, Sanderson and Huelvman. I, I don't know that that's true, but I'm guessing. Great. Uh, I am too. <laughs> so they were in the middle of looking for evidence of Bigfoot because this is like right at the beginning of the 70s. Bigfoot is becoming like a huge sensation. Sure. And so a lot of cryptozoologists were hearing about this thing that kind of looked like Bigfoot encased in ice. And so people were really excited to see it. And Frank actually invited them to his home to study this creature mm. to see if it maybe was Bigfoot. 
and originally they thought it was a um a forest cryptid called the nigoi rung which is a vietnamese like forest people cryptid and uh so that was their original thought they ended up writing about that a lot in a couple books and uh now they think a couple years later that it was a quote huge ape that was actually killed in vietnam where frank was actually stationed so they're like very interesting that you were he was in the air force he was stationed in vietnam at the same time that this huge ape actually was reported to have been killed there and so they think either he might have made up this whole story and then shipped this thing back to america or maybe it, it really did coincidentally happen when he was there and then it got shipped on its own from vietnam and then he found it we don't really know but it is an interesting coincidence mm -hmm. Um, and in that same year, there was kind of like a, like a stag magazine called, uh, the national bulletin. And what, what is that? Does that mean like a, like they would, po they would like publish some raunchy stuff. Oh, 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 got it. And, uh, they published a story about a woman named Helen who actually shot and killed a cryptid in the Minnesota area that looked a lot like this huge ape. Sounds pretty, Helen's pretty raunchy. I gotta say. Oh, there was, I, so there is one article. I'm not even going to mention the title of it because it's too not PC these days. Super. And, uh, it, that was pretty raunchy. Apparently, um, uh -oh. <laughs> I've, I've seen that it's, um, uh, it makes some like penthouse articles seem tame for today. <laughs> Cute. So, uh, but so there was the story that this woman named Helen and her name was Helen Westring and she shot and killed a cryptid while hunting in Minnesota. And that story has been used a lot to suggest that, um, that creature was also the Minnesota mm. Iceman. A lot of people in a lot of sources have said that it might be the same creature. That being said, um, the only Helen Westring at the time, like in the country, was said to be in her 50s and in Nebraska at the time of the story. So oh. it sounds like it was kind of a made up story that people are now leveraging into evidence. Sure. OK. Um, but anyway, so the 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 two cryptozoologists go to Frank's house and the three of them are examining it. They start calling it Bozo. That's like their loving <laughs> pet name for it, which That's is what I, I was going to say. Yeah, I wanted to get there before you did. Mm -hmm. Well done. You usually beat me the to it. The words were coming out and you were like, <laughs> no, no. Uh, so uh, they declare that it has, it's a new homo genus. It's called Homo pongoides. Whoa. And here are some of their findings. So first they looked at the freshness of it and it looked like it had, been deceased for a maximum of five years which validated the case that it might have come from vietnam oh so it was like not like from thousands of years no. ago or millions of years ago they also actually both of those cryptozoologists had another theory that there was still neanderthals living in our time today holy shit and so that also kind of confirmed that if it's only five years old and this is real it looks very much like a Neanderthal. Wow. It could confirm their theory of that. I do have a question. When they examine it, did they take it out of the ice or was it like through just looking? Excellent question, Christine. Finally, for once, after three years, I have an answer. No, you always have an answer. I feel like I never have yeah, an answer. Yeah, but I have an answer that I'm not going to bullshit this time, which is no. <laughs> definitely a first. By the way, happy three years. I know. I was going to... We were already into your story, and I was like, I guess I'll say next episode. <laughs> I forgot. But yeah, three years together. Yo, three years. And look how far we've come still calling each other bozo yeah. still not knowing how to pronounce things not even a little bit life is good eva just carries us carries the entire goddamn show we just close our eyes and let eva pull us along <laughs> <laughs> um so okay so you asked how did they examine yes okay uh so they were just looking through the ice they weren't gonna like melt the entire thing and then look through it um that being said there are there's one story on the internet that says that a crack in the ice started showing up because since they were examining it for so long, it started mm, melting sure. and a crack in the ice showed. But the story I heard from someone who has a more personal relationship with the Minnesota Iceman. Jimmy Stewart. Jimmy Stewart. I spoke to him. <laughs> Apparently, when they were examining this, one of them was trying to get a really good picture of it. But because some of the ice is more fogged up than other parts, um, they were trying to figure out the right lighting to get the picture. Oh, no. And they actually had like a really hot lamp mm. that when they went to go bend over and like pick something up they put the lamp literally on the ice oh for god's sake and it was so hot that the ice shattered oh god so some the story online is that there's a crack in the ice the story i heard is that the ice shattered and so the you could see a lot of it up close wow 
which I don't know if I necessarily believe because if that's the case, while the ice isn't there, you should be taking a lot of pictures of it. And I couldn't find any like up close. Yeah, you'd think that that was like the moment to get in there. It's like an accident that like actually helps that like you might as well take advantage of. (laughs) Right. And there was so I'm kind of leaning more towards the um, the crack in the ice theory. Sure. But the crack in the ice did let air escape from inside and they immediately smelled rotting like decom. Oh, which the big question was, is this thing even real or was it like uh, some, sure. something that he just made as like a carnival event? Um, like rubber or something like a right. suit. Yeah. But now that they've literally <gasps> smelled decomposition, they're oh, like, this thing is fucking real. Shit. Like something, this was once alive and it is not. Think about that. Yeah. So that was their like biggest aha of yeah. like, Oh, it's smelling like putrefaction. Like it's, it's, this was alive. Ooh. So, um, Bozo stinks. Bozo is smelly. That's what Christine says He's about me. He's a dead fucking body. So honestly, <laughs> to be fair, smells like he's fucking Bozo the ice man. Have you heard? Have you smelled his locker? <laughs> <laughs> smells like a dead fucking body. Um, Oh, wow, time. we got to bring Megan back. Good times. So uh, they also noticed that there was a lack of a neck. It was just very muscular from the head to the shoulders. Um, the extreme hairiness, the to- the toes. I mentioned this earlier, actually. The toes were short, stubby, and all about the same size and length. No, ma- like there wasn't any change in oh, them. Oh, interesting. <clears throat> and they had callous pads, which suggests that this creature walked on all fours at least some of the time. And oh, so it was on the on the hands it was callous there were pads mm-hmm. on its mm-hmm. hands yeah got it and uh, and then also they noticed that there were also injuries like i know like i said mm-hmm. earlier so um the ice man looked like it had been shot in the eye Ooh. and it looked like it had a wound in its right arm so interesting that it's like yeah covering, covering both of the things or it's uh, like both parts are wounded in some way oh weird so well, you know they say when you're being attacked your in your human instinct is to cover your head and your like internal organs so it would be like the natural def- right. defense pose. Exactly. Wow. So in 1969, Sanderson and Huevelmans, however we agreed that that Huvelman? was said. Huevelman. Uh, their findings are published and Bozo officially becomes, quote, the Minnesota Iceman. Much more distinguished name, I would argue. <laughs> yes. No offense, Em. No, no. I agree. Bozo and Sassy, that's fine <laughs> for a little bit. Um, so... This actually makes people at the Smithsonian interested Mm. because two expert cryptozoologists are saying that this thing is real and it smells like a dead fucking body (laughs) and it like it looks like it could possibly be real. Dr. Megan has a lot to say. (laughs) Well, Dr. Megan's name in this is Dr. John Napier. Close. And John is the director of the primate biology program at at the Smithsonian. Cool. So he went to go see the Iceman and after viewing the Iceman, he said that it was made of wax hair and latex. Oh, uh oh. So the Smithsonian, having spent a bunch of money on uh, trying to like go examine this thing. They're always getting getting the wool pulled over their eyes, so to speak. So they ended up uh, um, making this release and announcing it to the public. And this is a quote from it. The Smithsonian Institution has withdrawn its interest in the so-called Minnesota Iceman. As it is sati- as it is satisfied, the creature is simply a carnival exhibit made of latex, rubber, and hair. <gasps> Information has been received from a reliable source that the Smithsonian is not at liberty to disclose concerning the ownership of the model as well as the manner, date, and place of its fabrication. This information combined with some recent suggestions has convinced us beyond reasonable doubt that the original model and the present so-called substitute are one and the same. So... When I say the original and the substitute, the reason I bring that up, or the reason that they even mention that um, in their quote, is because despite that release, Frank swore that there actually was an original, and the one that the Smithsonian saw was a replica. So now the story's starting to change a little bit. So he's saying, like, oh, the ones that these two cryptozoologists published about, that one was real, and that's why they that's why they say it was real the one you saw was fake and that's why you're saying it's fake so why i my thought is if you're gonna show the smithsonian yeah, something show them the real if one If you know what you're doing why are you giving them the fake one the story starts to kind of break off here okay so um and to be fair the cryptozoologist did uh defend frank from the smithsonian saying like no this thing was real like right. whatever you saw was not what we saw 
Um, wow. Okay. But so the story starts to change, and Frank basically says that the Iceman is actually a latex replica of the original because on the advice of an attorney, he switched it out for the protection of its body because the ice might start melting again or it needs to kind of go into hiding because people were getting, like, frenzied about trying to see this thing. Mm. Um, so he just got advice like, okay, you have the real thing, get a fucking fake one made, and then just charge people to see that one so you're not carrying that around sure the country and then he was also starting to go on tour like in like canada and stuff so he was like taking it outside of the country and it was just getting really chaotic right that's why we hired um stunt doubles to go on tour for us Mm -hmm. it makes Mm -hmm. life so much easier yeah there's actually also a replica of eva we just don't like to tell anyone eva doesn't even know actually oh oops awkward surprise but our replicas they're much funnier than us and they're they're obviously (laughs) um so Frank apparently was bringing like once he felt like people now knew there was a fake one, he was sometimes bringing the real one out on tour. And then he would like tell the showman like, no, this is the real one this time. Like, I felt like bringing this one out this time. Then when the story came out that it might be real, it might be fake. Then he just went back to it being to only showing everyone the fake one. It just like it got really messy. Mm. This is why I didn't want to do this story for a while, because I don't know a lot of. It's a lot of like he said, he said. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and it's all the same person saying all these different things. <laughs> right. So later the story changed again that he never actually got the body from a wealthy owner, um, but he actually has had it since 1963 when he was stationed mm. um, in the Air Force. And while he was hunting, he says he came upon three of these ice men. He saw three of them. Oh. One of them charged at him and he got scared, so he shot it in the eye and then he also shot it in uh like his arm deflected it so that would explain the two injuries okay. that the two cryptozoologists saw apparently he freaked out because he'd never seen anything that big or scary so he ran away but he was not he, like he couldn't believe what he had seen so he went back to see if it was still there to prove himself that he had actually seen this creature and then he didn't think anyone would believe him when he it described the creature that he shot so he brought it home oh okay. so he uh he's like i know he literally didn't know what to do with it and so he told his wife that they were keeping it in the freezer <laughs> until spring oh my god so now there's like this bigfoot kind of thing in their freezer oh my god and this freaked people out because it was in the middle of i think the vietnam war right and he was stationed there and he shot a humanoid creature in the woods and then dragged it home and kept it in the freezer which means now the FBI thinks he might have killed a human being in a ghillie suit <laughs> that was also stationed there. Oh, like an American. Like like a person. I was they say they killed a lot of people over there. I don't know why they're suddenly concerned, but I guess if it's another soldier or something. Well, now that he's admitting, like, I shot something that kind of looked like a human, and then oh, I God, dragged I it, it home and put it in a freezer, the FBI is now like, we, you might have committed a homicide. Like, if this is... Yeah, but weren't wasn't he at war? Like, yeah, but it wasn't because he was like sure. in the middle of fi- like he well, was if just was attacking him. Look, I don't know. I don't know why I'm arguing with the FBI. I don't know why either. <laughs> they were like, you potentially committed murder because you were you just shot someone in the woods, and you know we have to investigate this now. Wow, because okay. not only are you because it's not like it was. Like I said, it's not like he was in the middle of a battle or anything. He was just deer hunting. He didn't know what he was looking at, but it was something humanoid and just shot it. So even if it was in defense, Mm. the fact that the police don't know if it... Because it's humanoid, they don't know if it's human or non-human. So, like, you might have killed a human being. And also you might be just carrying it around and charging people to look at it. Yeah, so they were afraid that he had been transporting and exploiting a dead body while crossing national borders. Yeah, that doesn't look... That's not a good look, I guess. So... He, like, got wind that that was even a possibility, and so he, like, we never really heard from Frank again. He was just, like, the Iceman just kind of tapered off like he wasn't really being shown at exhibits anymore, and slowly the, uh, I think because he was fearing a potential murder investigation, all of a sudden the Iceman goes missing. Oh, no. Which you would think this is when the FBI would really care, like, oh, a potential murder victim is now gone. Just, like, poof. But apparently they didn't care enough anymore. They were just like, okay, well, we threatened you with an investigation and you at least stopped charging people to see the body. Maybe it was kind of like, this is probably a a non-patriotic thing to say, Uh, but maybe they were just saying a statement of like, oh, well, we will look into this because this could be a murder and then like not 
be super into it. I Maybe mean, they weren't super into it. A yeah. lot of horrible shit happened to Vietnam. I think it would. It was a dark time. It wouldn't shock me that like this was down low on the priorities list of uh, of war crimes. But who's to say? I don't know. Sure. It's not me. It's not me who's to say. So <laughs> don't listen to me. It's not you. It's not me. It's not Houdini. It's, it's definitely mi- not. Don't. It's the Minnesota Iceman. It is because you're right. We had to add an addendum to M's original saying. <laughs> so the Iceman goes missing. And this is where the story varies again, because some, pe- some people say that they have no idea on earth where it is. But sometimes Frank implies to people that he hid it in the Midwest. <gasps> That's where I'm from. It's actually Christine. <laughs> Why you smell like fucking death. No, only when you break my icy exterior. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do. Can I ask a quick ask a question? Yeah. Blah, blah, ask a quick question. Now you can't. <laughs> I, can, I clearly can't. I'm physically incapable. Um, but I don't again, I don't know if this is something that's even answered. But like, I know he kept the body in the freezer and then brought it with him. But like, how did it get encased in ice? Like, did he? Um, I think because when he went back to shoot to see what he had shot, it was already in snow, so it already kind of been frozen. Oh. And then he kind of just threw it in the freezer, maybe filled it to the brim with water and okay. called it a goddamn day. I'm Got not sure. It. So it is like in a block. It's literally like in like a Han Solo. So he, yeah, so he probably just like froze not, it that not, way. You know what I mean. Not ice, but fr- frozen in that position in a tube of ice. I love the Star Wars reference. Got it. The, the very bad one. The really, that people cor- are gonna scream the really correct for. one that Blaze is definitely on board with. Um, so uh, sometimes Frank implied that it was hidden in the Midwest. Sometimes uh, Frank would actually say, oh, well, I don't have it anymore because it got lost in U.S. customs when I was bringing it back from Canada. But the U.S. and Canadian customs, neither of them have any reports on a hold for this thing. I think maybe it would be written down somewhere. Somewhere. You'd think. So it's still missing in 2004. We don't know where it is. And Frank dies. So, and it's been hiding since the 80s. And now it's 2004. Wow. No deathbed confession. No deathbed confession. Damn. So that being said, in 2013, the actual uh, sign, like the old wooden banner that Frank had painted that said, like, the Minnesota Iceman or the Creature in Ice. Um, that actually was found and sold on eBay. And uh, from it was found from, like, when it had been made in the 60s. Cool. It sells on eBay for 20 grand. I want it so bad it hurts. Well, it got bought. Damn it. By a guy named Steve Boosty. And we're going to talk about Steve Boosty real quick. So he was a kid in the 1970s. And he grew up in Honesdale, Pennsylvania. And this is a quote from him. When I was maybe four or five years old, it must have been 1974 at the time, I was really into dinosaurs, caveman, and the Bigfoot craze that was just starting. Mm. There were TV shows like In Search Of, and my aunt knew that I was going to love this thing, which was touring around the country in this tractor trailer. It came to our town and set up in the parking lot at a Kmart. By the way, it didn't matter if there was a carnival. He just would drive up and be like, do you want to see this thing or not? Or I'm going to go to the next town. And Kmart's like, you need to get off our property. He's like, give me five <laughs> minutes. <laughs> Uh, It was my aunt Ginger, my grandmother and me, and I saw the sign Creature in Ice. I went up these stairs into the dark tractor trailer and inside was this big frozen box, like a freezer with glass on top. All these adults were looking down into it, moving around, trying to get a good view. And I wasn't tall enough to see. So my aunt positioned me next to it. Ginger. And what's funny about this is apparently Aunt Ginger picked him up so he could like look into the glass. But the, the specific spot... Where she like picked picked him up and put him over the glass was right where the Minnesota Iceman's face was. Oh. So we came face to face with this thing. Um, wow. So he says, uh, I jumped up and came face to face with the Minnesota Iceman. I screamed. Everyone around me <laughs> laughed. It was a shocking oh. thing to see. Big teeth, blown out eyeball, hair all over its body. Ugh. I studied it intently. People had to go around me because I wouldn't move. Later, I did some research as an adult. And after years on the sideshow circuit, the Iceman was missing for years. And I became obsessed with finding it. Yes. So not only was he obsessed with finding the Iceman and not only did was he so obsessed, he eventually found the sign on eBay that he saw as a child and bought it. Yeah. But I think when he came face to face with this thing at five years old, it opened a whole interest in just creepy, cryptid, supernatural, paranormal He just got super into it, and it was always a big obsession of his. Wow. So uh, he ended up building a museum and collecting all of these weird things um, just because he was obsessed with the Minnesota Iceman originally. This guy is cool. I I take it back. He deserves the (laughs) freaking sign. I mean, seriously. So in 2016, Steve actually, what he had been looking high and low for this goddamn thing since he was like 20 or whatever. 
and he finally found the Iceman. <gasps> no. And he was like, I fucking need this. Yes. And he found out that it was actually still in that wealthy man's family. It, the family had inherited this thing and they were like, we don't know what to do. Like, Literally, what are you supposed to do? He's like, they were like, please take it away from us. So he bought it from them. The thing that he's been obsessing about since he was five. Unbelievable. He now owns it. And he made it part of his exhibit at the Museum of Weird in Austin, Texas. <gasps> oh, my God. It's coming full circle. <laughs> so we just had a show in Austin, Texas. Yeah. And it was we got in really, not really late, but like 8 o'clock at night. And I was like, what are things that are open late in Austin, Texas? Because I only have... Eva and I were like, margaritas and tacos. And Em was like, no. I was like, absolutely not. I need to do some weird shit. <laughs> And so I was like, what's open late in Austin, Texas? By the way, the answer is everything. Yes. And when I was specifically looking for something weird, the first thing that came up was the Museum of Weird that's open until midnight. And I was like, well, well, here I go. So I hopped on a little bird, went over to the Museum of Weird. And I didn't even know, by the way, that the Minnesota Iceman was there. I found out all this information after the fact. But I had been wanting to cover the Minnesota Iceman for months. I just happened to hear about this thing called the Museum of Weird. And you walk through the whole thing, and then the Minnesota Iceman is at the very end. And I didn't even know what I'd walked into. So you go into this museum. By the way, I got recognized by a very lovely mother and daughter. Oh, and my goodness. they were very excited. They were like, we're only in town for your show. I can't believe Wait, we ran into so you here. that's so sweet. So hello to them. Of, of, of all places, they run into you. It's they e were like, of fucking course we'd see you I'm here at 10 o'clock at it's night. It's pretty easy to find us. Because like when Eva and I were spotted in New Orleans, we were definitely just at a bar that had really good drink deals. Notice that I'm always alone when we go to cities and Eva because and Christine M are leaves, drinking. Because Em leaves <laughs> us, okay? It's not, all, we don't ditch you. No, I really like, I really like going on like self quests yeah and so usually when they're like oh i'm thirsty and i want to go get a margarita i'm like good i don't drink i'm gonna go do something really fucking weird yes yes so uh yeah that's but usually how you can find us we really are like so predictable like people are like wow it's uh this isn't even shocking that you're here. No, they ran into me. They were actually coming out of the room from seeing the Minnesota Iceman. And they were like, Ahem! and I was like, yep, here I, I mean, am. It's literally like I was Are saying, I was at the space exhibit, just staring at the ceiling for like <laughs> 10 minutes. And this woman's like, oh, I saw you. <laughs> so, uh, so you go through this whole um, museum, a lot of really cool stuff there. And then the last part of it is like a walking tour. And they take you into this room and you see this weird like cryo chamber. <gasps> And I was like, what the yeah, fuck that's, is in there? You're like, am I going to die here? And I'd forgotten totally about the Minnesota Iceman. I hadn't thought about it in a, like a few weeks. Excuse me. And um, and then I was looking at all the signs around. And the sign that he bought from <gasps> eBay from the 60s is How hanging above it. cool. So you can still see the original sign and then look down into the chamber and see the Minnesota Iceman. And there was a whole... Th that's how I found out some of this information that I couldn't find online. Yeah. And... um. But so I did get to see it. I got to go up and look in the cryo chamber. Oh, a cryo chamber. It looked super bananas. And like I said, it's now in its own temperature con controlled chamber. And I did ask if they plan on doing any more tests because even I there's apparently the real one and the fake one that he also would switch out every now and then. Apparently, this is the real, real, real one. Mm. And um, apparently the Smithsonian is now in the next couple of years going to read reinvestigate is what i was told so at they're the museum. finally like less heard about their original yeah i guess they're like okay if this is the real deal maybe we'll try it again i don't know if maybe that was the tour guide just like hyping me up but it was told to me that new investigations were going to be happening soon oh my god cool and um and yeah so a quick fun fact is uh special effects artists from fox and disney specifically a father-son team called bob and ken howell they actually say that this is not real. It never was because in 1967 they were hired to create the Ice Man. <gasps> but Frank says they were hired to create the replica, not the real thing, the replica from the real thing. And another fun fact is that they. But then wouldn't they know that there was a real one and be like, we had to copy the real one to make the right? fake one? That's you what know, I would think. It's a little fishy. They also are the ones that made the mammoths down at the Librea Tar Pits. Oh my God. And oh, so, I love the guys. If you have not been, it's so cool. Well, so for them, since they seem to have a, a lot of experience and knowledge on that specific time period. Oh, sure. They already know how to like fucking build a mammoth. They probably it's, it's just interesting that they're also 
making other either prehistoric or yeah, mysterious yeah, yeah. creatures. And what's a coincidence about that is uh, Jimmy Stewart was actually a large donor to the museum. <gasps> he had the Libre Tarpet. So interesting twist. I'm not saying Jimmy Stewart owned the Iceman. I'm not saying that the special effects people oh, made right. this We don't thing. even know 100% it was him who even owned it. But, but it's interesting that the wealthy potential is. owner of the Iceman also made a large donation to this place where he could have possibly funded a replica being made wow. and then keeping it hush-hush. Which is interesting because if you go back and look at the public release that the Smithsonian said, they said because of people who say that they, were, they helped fabricate one of these mm. creatures which we will not disclose they were probably talking it was about probably these guys who were like hello we've said it yes so anyway that's the minnesota ice man i have no clue about this i've never heard about this i was i was shocked i'm really it really happened in a very weird way because all of a sudden i was next to the chamber looking at the minnesota ice man and i was like you son of a bitch i was about you to little sneaky i was about bastard. to talk about you and have never seen you i just see you wagging your finger yeah and then you i saw little... it little and i was like well now i have to report it about it i have so. to report this to somebody I, I have to report this that's a fact <laughs> oh my god that is so cool well when you said you came face to face i was like like in the woods were you hiking despite everything you go everything against in your body that I goes was against hiking feet away from him unbelievable oh sorry that is banana grams yeah it is it's really banana it's really noodles it's noodles by the way we're starting that up um you already told that remember i don't care i'm gonna say it again okay I said noodles one time. It fucking killed. Yeah. And we, by it, the killed, I mean like the audience of Christine and Eva. So uh, now we're saying noodles a lot. Yeah. I remember we were saying how I like I personally had never heard Eva laugh so uproariously. And uh, suddenly. I felt really good about myself. We just kind of stared back. We, like I stopped laughing to look at M. like, wow, you really got Eva back there. <laughs> that was pretty good. Anyway, it was noodles. It was noodles. <clears throat> wow. This is a good one, Em. I liked that a lot. Thank you. Um. I have a story for you today that I am also extremely excited to share. Oh my goodness. Look at us go. Look at us go. Who would have thought? Look at us. Uh, so this is the story. It's one that I've heard of for years and never really had like fully committed to doing until now. Finally um, bit the bullet, so to say. Okay. And this is the story of Dorothea Puente, mm. a.k.a. the Death House Landlady, a.k.a. the Shadow Killer. Oh, that's arguably the creepiest one of all. That is. I am excited. I don't know what this is, though. OK, never perfect. Heard of it. Perfect. Perfect. Just how I like it. OK, so I'm going to just kind of start from square one here to give you a little background. Best place to start, I think. The I beginning. Think I usually start at like square 48 <laughs> times two. Have you ever seen me try to figure out floors on a house? <laughs> I usually start on the ninth floor and end. Yeah, and we on, all, we've all seen like that. on floor three. I was like, okay, so we're on the first floor. Then we go up two floors and we're in the basement. And I'm like, wait, you just said we went upstairs. <laughs> I'm so confused. We're in the attic and then we're going but you know, upstairs. But you know what actually is, that's, com I'm completely wrong because what happens is you say that and I go, uh-huh, okay. And I follow completely <laughs> until we post it and people go, that's why we're friends. Yeah, I just follow along. You I, really just follow blindly, which I appreciate. One, always, 100%. Okay, so let's go. So early life, Dorothea was born Dorothea Helen Gray in Redlands, California, which mm. incidentally is where my brother went to college. Fun fact. Fun fact. University of Redlands, baby. I one time visited him and I was just shocked at how unbelievably beautiful this place was. Never been. It's gorgeous. Um, he didn't love it, but that's besides the point. So she's born January 9th, 1929 in Redlands, California. She is the sixth of seven children born into a pretty impoverished family. Uh, her parents died when she's pretty young and she is sent to an orphanage and is, uh, later adopted by relatives. So fast forward five years in 1946, Dorothea reportedly marries for the first time to a guy named Fred and she, the two of them have, uh, so this is where it gets a little dicey because I love it so quickly, so quickly, but it's more just like that. It's unclear, uh, what exactly <clears throat> happened to the children, which is slightly alarming. Oh boy. Um, so she, depending on the source, either had one or two daughters who she either put up for adoption, left to live with relatives, or one of them could have died, or 
the her husband left her and or he died of a heart attack so we don't really know this was very er (sighs) early Could really just go anywhere huh it's like a choose your own adventure but everyone kind of ends up in a very bad place at the end it's like choose your own adventure every one of them is sad everyone loses your adventure (laughs) just sucks Uh (laughs) choose your ready sad venture oh oh choose your own sad venture tm for tiktok don't steal that (laughs) swear to god so instead of a tm we should call it a tt a ttm a tiktok tttm tiktok trademark take me out this is so stupid it's a ttt a tiktok trademark sure okay whatever stop don't steal that either okay so in 1948, Dora Thea has her first little foray into crime. She uh, is convicted of forging checks and is originally sentenced to one year but serves only six months in jail. Then in 52, she marries another man because, remember, we don't know if her first husband uh, died or left or what happened to him. So she marries a Swedish man named Axel Johansson, and mm. the relationship is abusive violent uh but they remain legally married for 14 years uh in the 50s so looking back dorothea now claims that uh well not now but in later years she claimed that in 1957 uh she toured with the rockettes great interestingly that claim is fully unfounded uh as is the fact that she won ten thousand dollars so I don't know. Both sound awesome. Both sound awesome if they're true. Um, Mm. But there is kind of this whole notion that you'll come to learn about her is that she just fabricates a lot of things and lies a lot. So she's here for the theatrics. Here for a walking theatrics. I. Yes. All of you are just walking theatrics, walking through my life. <laughs> um, so in the 60s, Dorothy is back in her crime life. She's sentenced to 90 days in jail for starting a brothel. Oh, boy. That's fun. Okay. Shortly after her release, the same year, she serves another 90 days for vagrancy, which is like, okay, Dope. totally different level here. And then in 1961, uh, Johansson has Dorothea committed to a psychiatric hospital. Oh. So... It's slightly turbulent, her life, at this point. She's no longer with... Choose your new sad venture. Choose the next sad venture on your journey. Uh, Yeah, so she... The children, she's not connected to her children anymore, uh, is now not with either of her husbands and has been sentenced to a psychiatric hospital. And uh, one... Wow. Sorry, The dogs are really going through it today. Sorry, everyone. I'm back. Um, There is someone coming to my house at 6 to... uh, Fix my oven, so I just want to keep an eye on my ring doorbell, make sure. Uh, at six to fix, I okay. see. Yep. That's that's what they say. That's what they say about, that's what they're going to say. That's what I just said. That's what you're going to say when the man walks in. I'll be like, oh, you're at six to fix. like, wow, you're hilarious. Um, okay. <laughs> He's going to be like, I hate you. Please go away. like, I regret taking this job. Okay, let's see. Where am I, everybody? I'm so sorry about that. Um, She, <clears throat> her husband put her in a psych ward. Sure. And now she is working as a nurse uh, uh-huh. and begins to manage boarding houses. She divorces uh, her Swedish husband, and she marries another man. Uh, he is 16 years younger. They get married Ooh. in Mexico City. Mm-hmm. And at this time, so she has some family friends. They're called the Orderica family, and they have this, like, beautiful Victorian house uh, that she... Okay, so by the way, I forgot to tell you... The reason I picked this story for this week is that it's set in Sacramento, and we're going to Sacramento this week. That's fun. Um, So, fun fact. uh, This is a shout-out. By the time this comes out, we'll have left, but in honor of Sacramento, I'm doing this story. So, the family has this house in Sacramento, and they are moving, and they're trying to sell it. And she proposes this idea to the Orderico family. She's like, well, why don't I just move in, and I'll pay you rent, and that way you don't have to go through the trouble of selling the house and yada yada and they like are like that's a great idea you can move on in and she's uh you know older at this point and she's like and they very trusted in the community like a pillar a pillar you one might say a pillar one might one might one might and a, p- a killer of the community a killer of the community a killer of the community mm. pillar killer killer pillar we'll work on it okay we know on. Okay, uh, so <laughs> happily. You got it. <laughs> happily. Okay, so now she's like in her middle age at this point. Uh, her husband, Robert uh, Puente, where she 
ends up getting her the name that she keeps for the rest of her life. Noted. He is unfaithful to her. And so uh, she separates from him in 1969. And she opens a 16-room boarding house in the Victorian mansion that she had bought from the Ordorico family. Mm. Or she's renting from them now, basically. So this is located, the building's located on 21st and F Streets in Sacramento. If you want to go check it out, maybe we can stay there, Em, when we're there. Yes, I'll, I'll be there tomorrow. I'll let you know how That's it goes. Right. You're literally flying there tomorrow. That's I, true. Uh, For my self-quest, by the way, I asked Christine to let me go a day early. Happily, I'll let you go a day early. I was like, I'd like to explore, please and thanks. Yeah, I. Uh, that'll be fun. Maybe you'll get recognized at the weirdest thing in Sac- Sacramento. I'll meet the Puentes. Please don't. Okay. You'll see why. Okay, uh, so... Now we're in the 70s. Yay. All right. Tubular. I mean, far out. I mean, radical. Groovy. In the early 70s, uh, Dorothea began to cultivate. So she has this boarding house, right? She begins to cultivate relationships with social workers who are really on board with this new boarding house she's created because they're looking they're they're taking care of these people who are down on their luck a lot of them are struggling with mental illness uh, a lot of them have addictions that kind of thing and have trouble holding a job staying um have holding a residence that kind of thing and so she opens this boarding house is super welcoming and is like i want to open this up to people who are in need and so she befriends a lot of social workers who are like this is great. An older woman in the community, very ch- a pillar, who has this beautiful Victorian house where she wants to help these people find stabilize, basically, mm-hmm. get back on their feet. So, sure. <clears throat> mid nineteen seventies, uh, there's neighbors begin to notice a local man known only as Chief, who um, <laughs> there he is. That's what they call me. That's what they call you. Uh, who he. <laughs> He worked for Dorothea on the property. Nobody really knew how this kind of relationship was set up. Um, And he didn't have, he was living at the building. He didn't really have like a stable residence. And what he would do is he would bring wheelbarrows and buckets filled with dirt. She, so she gardened a lot. Oh, okay. That was like. He just said like, he brings wheelbarrows. I know it sounded like, okay. Literally, it's so weird because. That was so she had a driver. I don't know. She had a driver and this driver always described like, God, every six months she would go to like whatever the Home Depot or, what you know, and buy like <laughs> all this crap for the garden. And she was obsessed with building this beautiful garden. And so whenever the landlords who owned the house, her friends would come over, they were like amazed because she like fully landscaped the backyard, made it gorgeous. And so she hired this guy, uh, Chief, who was like this really kind of grumbly quiet man um Mm. and he basically spent all day like working for her and filling up the wheelbarrows with dirt and helping her i don't know she (laughs) was driving them around she was kind of old and he was strong just throwing shit around you know you know how you do just digging holes i garden like a gopher clearly (laughs) clearly we spend a lot of time in nature em and i are gophers outside yeah no and they're they're in they're under your bed what do you think they are okay um right so one day neighbors were like huh that's weird we haven't seen chief in a while oh no mm-hmm. he went he hold it and hold digging like a gopher yeah he even just go for away i will say <laughs> he goes for is it so okay uh, uh, <laughs> i'm sorry oh god oh no <laughs> gopher so let's just say this is the first kind of red flag. People are like, well, this guy just kind of disappeared. She had no really reason. But but a lot of it was easy to explain because, these, you know, a lot of these people came in and out and they hadn't held regular steady jobs or, you know, a lot of them, again, like were struggling with addiction or mental illness. So sure. it was kind of easy to say, well, who knows? Like he just wandered off or right. whatever. And how long did he work for her? Do we know? Um, so it seems to be... A couple of years, early 70s, it like looks like. long enough to be friends? I would say, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And she was also extremely close with um, the people who lived in her boarding house. There were 12 rooms and she had also, I want to add to like very, very strict rules. So people like, for example, in the morning, she served breakfast at 5.30 a.m. And if you were a second late, you were not allowed to eat. Like you Ooh, would have to go. You couldn't even have coffee. Strict. Yeah. You had to go back to your room. 
And this was really hard on a lot of them because, you know, if you're really struggling mentally or ha- however. You're getting out of bed at the right time At five every in day. the morning? I mean, come on. On my best day, I can't do that. No. So, uh, so she had held very, very, very strict rules in this house. But um, she also was very, very, like, nurturing towards the people in the home. Like, um, most of them were men. Some were women. But... She became very, like, she was sort of like a mother figure to a lot of them okay. um, who didn't have families of their own and that kind of thing. Excuse me. So in the mid-70s, Dorothea is just becoming a stronger and bigger pillar of the community as years go by. She's donating to charities, political campaigns. She's very involved. Uh, later, she said that in the mid-70s, she met Clint Eastwood, Spiro Agnew, Jerry Brown, and Ronald Reagan. However, there is zero evidence of any of that being true. So, Just like the Rockettes thing. And- kind of like the Rockettes thing. Um, there is actually a photo of her meeting, uh, Jer- uh, meeting Jerry Brown. But, like, the other one, like, I don't think she met Ronald Reagan. Maybe she did. Like, she could have, like, waved at him yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of like a Had little a, slight yeah. exaggeration. But in the same diner as him. Perhaps. Yeah. Uh, in 1976, she could have been like us. Like, we just kind of blow everything out of proportion. <laughs> like, yeah. she was like, oh, yeah, I saw Ronald Reagan, like, at the Space Museum taking selfies. And <laughs> I saw him. So I met So him. we're friends. So we're married now. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, I saw I saw him at the Museum of Weird before I ran to the Minnesota <laughs> Iceman. Uh, yeah, so who's to say? But uh, it's just worth adding to that, like throughout this whole time, she's kind of making herself seem way more grandiose than she probably was. Um, in 1976, Dorothea marries again. Was that Gio? That was Gio. Oh, he's... hi, Giovanni. Oh. Let me see if Uncle Lim. Go sit on the couch. Good boy. Lie down. Lots so good. Lots so good. Oh, so sweet. Oh, so sweet. Oh. No. Jill, go back on the couch. On the couch. Okay. Well. Hey, G. Hi, good boy. Hi, good boy. Okay. Okay. Can you say Gio, everybody? He's here. Hi, good boy. (laughs) I love you more than anything on earth, and that's a fact. Hi, good boy. He's very happy to be here. Um, he wa- Is this your first YouTube appearance, good boy? Is it actually? I think so. Giovanni. I will say... Oh, All right. All right. Sorry, everyone. We're back. Um, Gio does this thing where after the mail comes, he comes to find me to let me know that he's scared off the mail carrier. So... He just wants to let you know he protected the yeah, house. Yeah. No, he does. It's really funny and he gets so excited and proud and then I have to give him a lot of attention. But when, when is that not the case, I guess? Um, so I, I It's apologize. like any Scorpio being like, I destroyed him. Now <laughs> praise me. I destroyed you. Now praise me. <laughs> okay. Um, so anyway, as I was saying, she at this point marries for the fourth and final time to a guy named Pedro Montalvo. But that marriage only lasts a few months before it goes down the drains. And at this point, she uh, comes up with a really fun new habit, which is that she starts going to bars um, and she's like an older woman uh, and she kind of has this very uh, kind of grandmotherly look. Like if you look her up, she looks very much matronly, like like a 80s grandmother. Like, yeah, like she wore, you know, little house dresses and giant glasses and well, maybe some mumus had like a perm. Yeah, yeah. Like Like a day mumu. Yeah, yeah, and she looked very, people were very charmed by her because she just seemed very gentle and, like, sweet and charming, you know. So she began going to bars, and she would meet, uh, she would kind of, like, sniff out the people in the bar who were older, who had, um, you know, alcohol addiction, who uh, a lot of times uh, had social security checks that she could somehow con her way into becoming a part of. Uh Uh-huh. And so this is uh, what she started doing. She started forging social security checks after kind of sneaking information out of people. And so in the late 1970s, she is arrested for this forged check scam um, because people in the communities where she would do this finally caught on and basically reported her. Mm. But uh, so she is when she's on probation, she continues her scam. She just cannot help herself. And uh, this keeps going on and on. And in 1981, she starts renting an apartment in downtown Sacramento. And this is at 1426 F Street. Uh, And this is where things get pretty wild. 
Okay. Okay. So pretty noodles. Pretty some might say. noodles. One might say like a little new new. Whoa, that was fucking <laughs> new new. I'm not scared the shit out of me. <laughs> I did the table thing again. Oh um, oh that um. Was noodles. Oh my god. Thank God we already drank our Starbucks. That could have ended really poorly. Thank God you drank that beer on the table. Thank God. Really I drink beer to make your life a little easier. I'm just gonna stop touching it. Okay, go ahead. Okay, great. What's the noodles part? Okay, so this gets really noodles. And now that I'm reading this, I'm thinking... I'm confused. I, I understood that the house that she had purchased originally was from that family that I mentioned. It might have been this house. Are there a lot of Victorian homes up there? Sure. Okay. I don't know. So in the early 80s, okay, so she buys this house and... If it is based on what I learned, I mean, then again, I watch a lot of these investigation discovery things and they kind of tend to condense information and, you know, it's occurring in multiple houses, but maybe they make it seem like it was one place. You'll see at the end. But so she starts creating this boarding house, even though legally she has been banned from creating a boarding house because of all her illegal activities, but because she was kind of... um a charming older woman. Love it. Nobody seems to suspect the pillar of the community. Why would you? Why right, would you? Right. So uh, over the course of the 80s, she adopts more matronly, as you said, mannerisms, clothing. Uh, she even ages herself intentionally 10 to 15 years to appear more harmless and trustworthy. So yeah, she has some nefarious plans. Let's put it that nefarious. way. Nefarious. We got to start bringing that That's word. That's a great freaking word. I love it. Feels right. Yep. It feels uh, wrong. It feels wrong. So right and so wrong. <laughs> In the early '80s, she begins acting as a home caregiver, uh, and this is that same idea of you know she would find people who were down on their luck, who had addictions, who struggled with mental illness, and she would basically talk either them or their social worker into letting them live under her care and uh at this point it is believed that she drugged three separate women to steal valuables cash and checks from them in april 1982 again like all of this did not come out until later so it's very much a timeline of like everything seems fine and then later on they look back and they're like holy shit all of this has been going on for decades yeah hindsight's 2020 yeah just sprinkling Mm -hmm. sprinkling some fun facts in here for you please do keep things interesting um so in april 1982 uh what my apologies the dogs are truly driving me up a wall right now this is what happens when we wait until the end of the day when they get all rowdy that's the thing is they sleep in all day and we're eating pasta and they're asleep and we're like this is so perfect and we calm. got we got why way we, too cocky why do we do this we gotta start remembering to do it earlier in the day we gotta know better man okay three years still have no idea oh there's a hole in my sock oh no oh, not that too <laughs> that was the last fucking straw this is the podcast has now ended <laughs> The, the hole in the sock. Choose your sad venture. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. Here we go. Okay. I don't even now anymore know where I am. Nefarious. Okay. Nef- so nefarious. Okay, guys. Yeah. So nefarious. So Dorothea had a tenant uh, at her home named Ruth Monroe. Mm-hmm. In April of 1982, uh, Ruth Monroe was found dead in her room. Oh boy. Dorothea, Dorothea tells police that uh, Monroe was distraught, was suicidal. Uh, the death is ruled a suicide. Okay. And I have a hunch it wasn't, though. <laughs> Do you? Yeah, I think so. Hmm. Um, and Dorothea was, oh, wow, named a beneficiary of Monroe's. And so she collects a, a cool six grand from her. A cool six grand. A few weeks later, in 1982... Dorothea drugs and robs 74-year-old pensioner Malcolm McKenzie. Okay. He even she even stole the pinky ring off his finger okay. as he was dying. Just like looking at him die and was like, "Hmm, I'll Let take me, this too." Let him have his goddamn ring. I mean, for God's sake, yeah, last just for 5 more seconds. Really, truly. Um so on August 18th, 1982, the same year, Dorothea is convicted of three charges of theft. And is sentenced to five years at the California Institute for Women in Corona, California. I was going to say, she's just getting away with this. Yeah, she's getting uh, caught for theft, but not, theft for the, maybe for that pinky ring, but <laughs> not much else. Not the dead person attached to the pinky ring. Not all the dead people, yeah. Uh, so, 
while she's in prison, Dorothea begins to correspond, correspond with uh, a guy named Everson Gilmouth of Oregon. Okay. And in September of 85, she's released from prison. And guess who's there to pick him, pick her up? Who? It's a good guy named Everson Gilmouth from Oregon. Perfect. He shows up in his red Ford pickup truck and uh, comes to uh, pick her up. And immediately they begin to talk of marriage. Oh, he moves into the apartment with her uh, for $600 a month. She, he's paying her rent to move in there. And uh, her federal probation at this point um, extends to 1990. Okay, so it's the mid-80s at this point, And her probation is set until 1990. But during this time, she is prohibited from having a license or a permit to operate a boarding house for very obvious reasons. Uh, so in – which she, like, grossly disobeys. So – don't even worry about it. Obviously, <laughs> she's a pillar of the community because she can do whatever she wants. Uh, yeah, that is has been made <laughs> clear. In November of 1985, she hires a handyman named Ismael Flores. Ismael? Ismael? Ismael. Ishmael? Maybe. There's no H, but Ishmael. Oh. I don't know. Uh, in exchange for labor and $800, she gives him Everson Gilmouth's pickup truck. Oh, and people are like, that's weird. Wouldn't he want to keep his pickup truck? Do we know about this What deal? an odd payment. Yeah. And also, that's not yours. Um, but then they realize, that's odd also, is that Gilmouth has not been seen for a week. <laughs> also, where is also, he? <laughs> also, hold on. Why are you giving away his car? <laughs> and where did he go without his car? <laughs> oh, my. Yeah. Uh, so that's a weird fun fact that people were like, huh. Anyway, let's move on. Moving on. <laughs> so before Flores finishes his work, who's the person that she just gave this truck to, uh, her missing lover, uh, Dorothy requests that he build her a little something something for the backyard. She requests that he build her a wooden box that's six feet by three feet by two feet. So a coffin? Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> okay. He does so. And then... I mean, listen, this woman gave him a big red pickup truck. He's probably like, okay, like if you want me to build a box, right. it's like an elderly woman. You don't think like, oh, she's so nefarious, you know? Right. Well, she's not even elderly. She's just making herself look 15 years older than her kind Bananas. of middle-aged self. So he does this. He helps her build this box and then he helps her dump the box alongside of the highway. So that's good. And he he's not aware of what's happening? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay he's just like sure all right just like wow look at that pillar of the community in her mumu just so killing it <laughs> sweet killing so it sweet. killing people choose your own adventure <laughs> um so uh now i got really worked up here we okay got goofy sorry we got goofy how dare i so uh he helps her dump this box on the side of the highway I wonder if she was just like, mm, never mind, I don't want it anymore. Can you put it over there? <laughs> like, My thought was like, I, if I were her, I'd be like, I wonder when he's going to notice. Yeah, like, what is happening here? If I were her, I'd be like, let's push this a little farther. Like, <laughs> hey, could you also light it on fire and push it down the hill? Also, could you send the police a, a letter saying never look for me? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so Dorothea continues to collect uh, her lover's Gil Mouse pension and social security checks, obviously. She even writes letters to his family. Uh, Pretending to be him? So she didn't pretend to be him, but okay. she did say uh, that he's pretty sick, so she's writing on his behalf, and that he says hello and is doing great. He just has kind of... She's a little under the weather, so he's unable to write, but so she's going to write for him. So she continues Ugh. this like weird charade. And then on January 1st, 1986, uh, he... Someone is perusing the side of the highway. Uh, discovers Everson Gilmouth's decomposed body in a wooden box on the banks of the river nearby. Uh, he, weirdly enough, remained a John Doe at this point. So What? Okay. He was discovered. Uh -huh. The body was discovered. Uh -huh. But again, nobody would have tied this to her. Like, there's no way to tie this to her. So at this point, there's just this John Doe been found on the side of the highway. Okay. Um... Dorothea continues to take tenants at this time up to 40 total, like spanning the whole time that she ran this illegal boarding house, by the way. Uh, she had 40 residents. What she would do is she would steal their mail. She would forge their checks. She would then give them a small stipend to kind of keep them going and keep them quiet. Uh, if they complained, then this is pretty fucked up. She would report an anonymous 
<gasps> report to the police saying that this tenant was being disorderly and drunk and oh, like no. violent and like, then like they, they relapsed or something yeah yeah she would take advantage of exactly she would that take advantage fucked up and report them anonymously so it wouldn't even come back to her and then they would get picked up and taken in and she'd be like oh that's so tragic he was so like a son to me oh my you know? god yeah and there's actually so while they would sit in jail and temp- usually temporarily because it would be like a drunken disorderly they would sit in jail for a month or two and this whole time she would continue to steal their checks and now it was obviously even easier because they were in jail and uh the mail carrier even said like she was the only she would wait outside for the mail and take it in her own hands and would not let anyone touch it or look at it like she was super weird about getting the mail because she didn't want and remind me what was her reasoning if they ever asked like where can i have my check she would they she would just say it's like for rent or yeah i don't know if she would pay them oh but i think she would steal so it's like take a cut of it yeah i think okay. she, i think she probably would take a cut of it she would give them some and she would feed them and house sure. them so you're probably right that a lot of it was phrased as like well you're living with me so i'm going to right take okay. some of your money i don't know but a lot of the times like there were people there who were really really couldn't survive on their own um who were had were battling schizophrenia like really bad cases of schizophrenia who could barely function on their own right and so she it was just super easy for her to take advantage of these people who wouldn't even know to ask for their Mm. social security check so that happened a lot as well and then when they did notice obviously she would just be like i'm gonna call the police real quick on you and have you sent to jail so uh meanwhile through all of this bullshit dorothea is still like the social worker's little angel um because she's just like no bring them to me they're like a really difficult case they're really struggling like i will take care of them you know and and it's it's just so fucked up and uh and blech. so a lot of times anytime they had a problematic person that they didn't know where to place or they had struggle finding a spot for them they would call dorothea and she would always take them in <coughs> excuse me so in august night on august 19th of 1986 one of Dorothea's boarders, um, a woman named Betty Palmer, vanished. Uh, weeks later, Dorothea began using her ID uh, with Dorothea's photo to collect her benefit checks. So she Great. she disappeared, but then, uh, you know, she w- this was even better for Dorothea because this person would disappear, this time Betty, but for example. Right. And like, just like the people who were in jail, they couldn't say anything because they didn't know. And so if they were vanished, she could just be like, I don't know, but the mail's still coming to my house and keep collecting it. So fast forward a couple years, uh, in February of 87, a woman named Leona Carpenter, age 78, takes up residency in Dorothea's boarding house. She is never seen again. Okay. In July, this is where it just like rapidly declines. There's no other way to kind of phrase it. Like just people just start disappearing. People just start going away. Got going bye bye very quickly, uh, very nefariously. Don't you? <laughs> I'm overdoing it, huh? Don't you dare! In July of 1987, 62 year old James Gallup is put in Dorothea's care. Also never seen again. Jeez, wow. October 1987. So this is all the same year, by the way. 62-year-old Vera Martin moves in and disappears shortly thereafter. February of 98, uh, I'm sorry, of 88, so a couple months after that, a guy named Bert Montoya, um, he actually, so he's 52, he actually was referenced in one of the Investigation Discovery episodes I watched, um, I think it's called like A Stranger in My House or something, but so they talked about, they used him as kind of a focal point for the episode, and he has, uh, And they have video of him, like original footage, which makes it even sadder because you can like see this man. He was struggling deeply with um, schizophrenia and his social worker was really trying to find a place for him and finally thought it was like such a blessing that she discovered um, Dorothea and was like this. Such a shame. Yeah, it is. It's really tragic. And uh, this this man, you know, didn't have family. He had lost his social security number. And so he was unable to collect uh, any sort of benefit from the government because he was just he just was really struggling to function they in the show they mentioned like the medications that he'd been put on just weren't working um and he he said he could still hear voices no matter how many medications they put him on and so she of course said oh please bring him to me and basically from this point on um Bert became like her like her uh project 
Yeah, kind of like her project. He <clears throat> basically thought of her as his mother, and and he was really. Uh, they got a weird codependency. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like, I mean, you know, she fed him, take care of him. He didn't have any other family. And so to, to him, she was like a, a mother figure. And she took a liking to him and like really tried to help him on a one-on-one level that apparently the other tenants actually were a little bit jealous of because they were like, well, we're paying rent and stuff. And like, he's getting extra Right, like, why aren't you taking care of us like that? Yeah, exactly. And so he, like, she definitely played favorites and Bert was definitely a favorite of hers. Um, and he really liked living there. At first. Mm. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. Let me see. Now I lost my place again. Oh. So she took over his affairs because he needed help with managing his, you know, all his uh, financial, get his financial stuff in order. So she, what an angel, took over and made sure that she would take care of it for him. Um, in October of 1988, uh, it's said that suddenly people started realizing he wasn't around anymore and because he was such like a primary resident of this place and was like her right hand man like he helped her with every project like he kind of took over so that other guy who would like help the care, wheelbarrow, the wheelbarrow guy yeah. yeah so he would help with all of that same stuff he kind of took over a lot of the residents just the right hand man yeah. yeah the right hand man and a lot of people again got jealous because it was like well i was being paid to do that and now suddenly he's here and he takes over all the tasks and right Yada, yada. So all of a sudden, neighbors are like, that's weird. He's not around. And, of course, immediately his social worker is like, uh, where did he go? Because, like, I'm in charge of making sure he's okay. Where is he? That's he, important to I my need, job. I, right. This is kind of my entire thing is I need to know <laughs> where the hell he is. Um, and so she, the social worker files a missing persons report. And the police come to Dorothea's house and are like, well, we're looking for... Bert and she says oh here's a note uh that he wrote and it's it's a note saying he left and didn't want to live there anymore and she's like he just kind of left um and then a tenant of Dorothea's passes a note to the officer so the, okay <laughs> sorry so she gives the police a note that's from Bert quote mm-hmm. unquote got it and it says hi I decided to leave Dorothea's house Okay. And she's like, see, that's proof. He left on his own. <laughs> Another tenant passes a note to police. And this note says she instructed him to lie about Bert's whereabouts. Uh. So he's like, something fishy is going on here and I need to tell the police. Because they're looking into where he is. Got it. So things are starting to unravel. Mm-hmm. Okay. So November 1988. Police talk to this social worker who filed the missing persons report, and she's like, I don't care about this note. I don't think that's real. I think she's full of shit and shady as hell. And she also says, I think you should check the garden. And the police are like, what do you mean? Like, why check the garden? Uh Uh-huh. And she says, you know, every time I would go over there, there was a guy with a wheelbarrow running around, and there were piles of dirt, fresh piles of dirt. Uh Uh-huh. A.K.A. potential bodies? A.K.A. She was like, people seem to keep vanishing, and there's piles of dirt everywhere. And sure. also good, good place to start looking. Good place to start. And she also said, and obviously the, the, the man in my care is missing now, too, so this has now become very personal. Yeah. And uh, so police are like, all right, um, let's go back with a search warrant. And they show up, and she's very much, she's like, no, come on in, come on in. And... Like, stay away from the yard, almost? No, no. She's like, come on, come oh, on, okay. welcome to my home. And, you know, this elderly woman. And they're like, this is so weird because she's so charming and old and frail. Like, you would never think, you know? Yeah. Um, but when you walk in the house, there's, like, this terrible reek. Like, this terrible, terrible smell. To the point that neighbors had already reported this multiple times. And so, basically, things are adding up at this point where they're like, okay, we smell it. The neighbors have reported smelling it. A couple people have now vanished without a trace, and the social worker says there's piles of dirt in the backyard. Right. I mean, all signs point to this. Mm -hmm. So they start digging, and the guy who actually is the lead investigator was interviewed in the Investigation Discovery episode, and he describes looking, um, doing doing the dig, and they did it by, you know, on their own. They were like, we'll just dig a little bit. He's like, we dug three holes, we didn't find anything, and then, um, 
we dug another hole and he's like and I started finding these like pieces of leather and I was just like putting them in a pile I was like I don't know what this is there's also a lot of trash like she would bury her trash Hmm. and so he's like going through trash he's like we found all these pieces of leather he's like then I hit a tree root and so I was trying to get past it and I yanked on it with all my might and pulled out a femur goodbye (sighs) and it was a, a human leg bone goodbye Later found out that the pieces of leather were pieces of skin <gasps> that he was pulling out Disgusting. of the ground and did not know at the time. Thought it was just pieces of clothing. Nope. Pieces of Good skin. to know the skin becomes leather. How fun is that? I think uh, I guess I'm not I think really Ed surprised. Gein taught us that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, nipple belt. Fun times. Yep. Okay. So, um, oh, I also want to add fun fact. The people um, who, the family that was friends with her who had rented the house to her uh they so they came back a lot and to like check in and they were always amazed at like the garden and how much she worked like i was saying and they were like god she kept the house so beautiful and the garden so beautiful but they started to notice the smell and they were like okay this is like you're renting but this is our house like we don't like this right 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 and um the one thing the mom of this family noticed that that she had all these beautiful roses that she had like spent years cultivating in the back and one day she showed up and it was just concrete block like (gasps) all over where the roses were and she she was interviewed in this episode and she's like and at the time i was like pissed and she was okay she said this in spanish so i'm doing a lovely translation of my own uh sure mannerisms on top of what she was saying but uh she's basically like i was so furious like why would you pave over my roses like i worked so hard on those and you know we never agreed to this right right, and you had taken such good care of the garden and her only response was i don't like roses (laughs) so okay rude um so just all this stuff is kind of adding up obviously so anyway lead investigator pulls out a femur and a bunch of skin and uh apparently she's like Oh my god, I have no idea what that is. Like, of course, you know, she's like, How on earth could that end up in How my did a yard? human body get here? I mean, I guess to be fair, you could argue that someone else boarding there could have been exactly. doing all this. Exactly. Because there were so many people, 40 in and out. Going in and out all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you she, know, of course, people that she could easily blame saying, Oh, they had eh. like some people with like more like bad, like, or, like, not bad past, but, like... Who had criminal histories, a lot of them. Yeah. Who had, uh, you like, know... Like, probably not great... Altered state of mind Reputations yes. to public society. Exactly. And so there was a lot of, of stuff she could turn on other people. Um, but so they actually had come back for this dig. And so... So not smooth. And the investigator, like, said this himself. He was like... She said, oh, do you mind if I, like, head down the street... To grab something from a friend's house or something. Did she just bolt? She fucking pieced. She just ran off. In her little heels. Her little moo moo. They like showed her little heels and she was like all quick, dre- quick, quick, quick. dressed to the nines and just like waltzed right out the front door. And then it was right after that they discovered the first body and they were like, so Ooh. wait, where is she? And they were like, uh oh. Oh boy. <laughs> we let her. W- and she asked, she's like, do you mind if I head down the street? And then just pieced. Yikes. Yikes. Um, so... The first bodies they did find are of Bert Montoya. You know Bert, the the one that she treated like a son who had struggled with schizophrenia. Sure. Um, and then Betty Palmer were also discovered. Betty was found with her head and limbs removed. Torso. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, my, I heard my it. My least favorite thing. Head and limbs, so it was just the midsection. Just the torso, yeah. Yeah, great. And uh, I will also add they to this day have never found them oh and they have looked they dug under the porch they dug under the whole property and the lead detective says to this day it still baffles him and like haunts haunts him that they couldn't find the rest of her body yeah whoa um seven body it's also at this point okay well i'll get to that i'm skipping ahead they found seven bodies buried in her yard Dorothy Miller, 64, Benjamin Fink were found in addition to the previously mentioned who vanished uh from her care Finally, they are able to connect Gilmouth, the one in the shoddy coffin. Right, 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 right. The red tr- red pickup truck. Yeah, it guy. suddenly makes sense that uh, that this is connected. So they finally are able to connect him to this case, and the case is reopened. And so she, like I said, just kind of pieced out. One of her tenants, John McCauley, 
uh, is arrested and he uh, he's actually not formally arrested. He's taken in for questioning because they're like, how could this small woman you actually hear the interview. She's like, I'm how could I carry a 250 pound body like Bert right. was 250 pounds and six feet tall. She's like, look at me. How could I carry them? And so they're like, yes, someone must be working with her. They, because they said, for example, uh, the homicide lieutenant said, we do not believe that this could have been done solely by herself. We know she's had people help her dig the holes. So they had arrested him or at least taken him in. I don't know that he was officially arrested. But questioned. He was maybe. questioned and uh, he was let go because there was no proof they had that he had done anything wrong. And I think a lot of the times she had these people doing chores for her but they maybe ne- didn't necessarily know the full exactly. extent keep everyone kind of blind yeah. to the situation exactly yeah. and then if maybe they knew too much like bert for example started feeling uncomfortable in the home and was trying to leave and actually left a few times and she brought him back and and then he ended up dying so they yeah. think like he knew too much basically mm. um so the autopsies revealed uh that the all the bodies had like traces of sleeping pills in them, but not enough to kill them, but enough to kind of incapacitate them. Okay. So they were like maybe easier to drag or. Yeah, perhaps. And, and actually possibly one of the worst things. Uh, to torture them while they're alive? No. Is oh. that they think some of these people were buried alive. Yeah. <sighs> Which is my worst fear in the whole world. Um, and so, for example, uh, Leona, who I'd mentioned earlier, who had vanished. She's one of the first people to vanish. Her body had been found in a way where her legs had kicked up and packed the dirt in inside the space she was buried in. I know. It's really bad. Um, and so they think they were, like, incapacitated with sleeping pills and made them easier to move. Or maybe she tried to smother them and they just couldn't – they hadn't died all the way. I hate it. Yeah. I hate this. And uh, when they actually went into the home originally to, like, look around, you know, this horrific smell, they went into one of the bedrooms and they lifted the carpet. The lead detective guy lifted the carpet and he said it was, like, the most repulsive, putrefied smell. And he said it was a smell of body fluids. He's like, I know the smell of putrefied body fluids and that's Mm. what it was. And so they kind of – what they pieced together was that it was, like, a crime of opportunity. So she would decide to kill somebody. Whenever. And then if it was not the right time, if she didn't have someone to help her, if she didn't want, she would leave the body sometimes up to weeks in this spot. And then the hardwood floor underneath would just soak in all of the body. I know it's uh, horrifying. So it's just rotting wood filled with rotting fluids. Correct. And, And so the fact that they discover this underneath the carpet in this one room, which they called the killing room, fun. Uh, Super. Yeah. Uh, then when they dug open the graves, a lot of them had no smell whatsoever of decomp. So they were like, they probably mostly decomposed in the room and then she would bury Got them it. afterward, which is why obviously the house reeked so freaking bad. <sighs> People were like breathing that in while they were sleeping and yes. stuff. Yes. The neighbor said, apparently the neighbors, every time they turn on the air conditioning, it would suck right into the house. So they would have to... They were like, we basically lived outside. Like, we would just be outside all summer because he's like, we couldn't turn on the AC. It would, like, take all that air and Ugh. bring it into our home. Which, like, knowing afterward, oh, you must have thrown up knowing what you had been smelling. Oh, yeah. Horrifying. And it's awful because, I mean, the woman who worked in the family that – or, sorry, a member of the family who had, was renting the house to her was like, it's awful, but we would show up and smell it. And she would be like, you know, a lot of them don't really follow basic hygiene. And so everyone just assumed, like – it also, was the like, fault of these men who, and women who couldn't take care of themselves. Also, like, I am not in a position to know the experience of someone who suffers from addiction. Mm-hmm. But, like, I imagine that that scenario must really, like, would want anyone to, like, want to take a drink. Or, like, to, like, I'm sure it was, like, oh, very triggering. exacerbate. It probably wouldn't help, right? It's not a Like, c- it's, like, definitely, like, an anxiety and stress-induced yeah, environment now yeah. that you know what you've been breathing in. Yeah. It's like how like now it's just like additional things you have to like oh for sure control yourself. I mean, on. at the very least, it's added stressors and a very uncomfortable living environment, especially Ugh. when the person running the house makes you get up at five if you, or else you can't eat. You know, right? I mean, that alone to starve you. Yeah. So there's but then a, find out you're breathing in human. Oh god, ma- 
liquid. <laughs> when he said putrefied body fluids, I almost threw up in my mouth. Uh, um, yeah. So they found this these sleeping pills. They were her prescriptions. So they were not the prescriptions of the people in the boarding house, leading them to believe she was using her own prescription on these tenants that had died. So... This is the wildest thing. This is how, I mean, it's not all of that was the wildest thing. But one of the wild, wildest elements is how she was caught. Okay. Because remember, she had run away. Sure. What she had done, basically, is she, she just scooted off. She just birded away. <laughs> <laughs> Bird scooter. No, so she what she had done is she had taken a car. She, so she was in Sacramento. She had driven like a few hours south and then got a bus to L.A. to kind of reroute herself so that they couldn't sure. find her. When she got to L.A., she literally could not control herself. So she just ca- continued to do this fun plan. Wow. Yep. She didn't even hide. She just she went to a bar using the name Donna Johansson, which is interesting because I think that was the name of uh, her ex. Remember? Yeah. Johansson? Axel, yeah. Yeah. So Don- Donna Johansson. And she uh, she went to this the Royal Viking Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. Now, this is November of 88. And there's this statewide manhunt going on uh as directed by the fbi at this point this is like national news and she goes to a bar and she (laughs) finds she like she knows how to like seek out these people she finds this guy who's like older kind of vulnerable who falls for her little charm who she can tell is like has pension payments that she can take advantage of and so he really likes her he's like totally charmed by her and they kind of become friends and she's like oh like maybe you can room at my place and uh you can pay me rent and then he turns on the tv and sees her he's like holy shit that's donna johansson oof but it's not it's dorothea puente so he calls police and is like yo i just befriended this person who's apparently also trying to murder me um and so he thank god recognize her before she could do anything imagine the feeling of knowing what was about to happen in like five minutes how horrific right like she was fully about to take advantage of him so she is arrested thank god um and taken to trial so the pretrial begins april 1990 and in june on june 19th the judge finds that dorothy puente will stand trial for nine counts of murder uh february 9th 1993 so this has been three years almost uh they've had to change venue there's been a couple of delays finally the trial begins july 15th 1993 a couple months later they had brought in 153 witnesses and 3500 documented pieces of evidence Oof. and finally the case goes to the jury so the jury sends a note to the judge uh on august 2nd saying they are deadlocked on all nine counts wow so the judge instead of calling a mistrial is like no go back in there and try again <laughs> so uh they they go back in they try again finally 24 days later on august 26th the jury reaches a verdict they find her guilty for the crime of murder in the second degree in the case of leona carpenter uh crime of murder guilty of murder in the first degree in the case of dorothy miller guilty for the crime of murder in the first degree in the case of ben fink who by the way his body was found so he was a jewish man but he had a swastika tattoo and there's debate as to why that is the case. Um, but that's how they identified his body. So that helped kind of solidify okay. that he had been murdered um, and buried in the garden. Um, and then additionally, allegation under special circumstances found that Dorothea had com- committed multiple murders. So the s- remaining six that they could not agree on were listed as mistrial. Okay. But she had been found guilty of three of them, of three of the nine. Right. Got Which, it. you know, is at least enough. Better to, than, some, than nothing, n- I guess. Nothing, right. At least enough to put her away. So December 11th, 93, Judge Vargas handed down his sentence, and she, by law at this point, was sentenced to life in prison. And in 2011, she died of natural causes in jail. And uh, I have one final fact that takes a quick right turn from all of this. Okay. And this is also, weirdly, a connection that I have to this case. Very, very limited. Huh. But okay. somewhat. So in 2004... You met her in a glass chamber, an ice chamber in <laughs> Austin, in Texas. I looked in cryo chamber, and there she was. <laughs> it was she in her actually, moo-moo. She actually is the Minnesota Iceman. That checks out. Wait, now it all makes sense. 
Um, so in 2004, Dorothea had this pen pal, because, like, which fucking serial murderer does not have a pen pal at this point? Mm. Uh, his name is Shane Bugby, and he published a book called Cooking with a Serial Killer, which contained 50 of Dorothea's recipes and is available on Amazon. I have a signed copy. By her? Yeah. Shut up. Because somebody had given this to us at a live show. Wow. Like years, like two years ago, I think. Somebody gave this to me at a live show. Get out. Yeah. And so she had signed it. And I remember looking at it like, I don't know if I want to touch this. I feel like it has bad juice. She's held it. Yeah. Well, wow. yeah. Yeah. So I don't think, feel super great about that. But that was kind of a wild like, oh, yeah, I have that book. Strange. She, it's here? Yeah. It's somewhere here. Oof. I know. Wow. We got to we gotta pull that thing out. Make a couple, couple chicken wings or something. <laughs> Um, although I am glad to learn more about the case and know that she wasn't like cooking with human or something like that could have ended much worse. Could have been a lot worse. Yeah. Now, still bad. It is still bad. And I, that normally that would be the end, but I have one little last bit for you, which is that her house is hella haunted. Well, wow. And not surprised. I think that's why I was confused because a lot of the different episodes I watched framed the house as different they put it as like one house and i don't know Got if it. it was like two or three houses overall but the house that these last several nine murders pl- at least um took place in is now considered an extremely haunted location yeah. and i had the pleasure of watching a little ga little ghost adventures of course you did you watched the little bagel bites big bagel bites night for me last night and uh, i gotta say i really like this episode I know. I they really, are really good. The the newer ones I don't love. I think they're a little too in your face. This one is several years older and it's he's just a lot more chill. Like <laughs> he didn't hype up his own hype up it's yet. It's so much less in your face. Um which, you know, whatever, but I I really enjoyed it and it scared the absolute shit out of me to the point that I had to watch um uh The Good Place afterward. <laughs> the one about heaven. <laughs> And hell and demons. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Troubling. My brain is troubled. Uh, so I will say, if you guys want to watch it, I really recommend it. It was very good. Um, and they do give a little background. And the same guy, the lead investigator who pulled out the femur bone, is in yeah. is in the episode. Huh. And he talks about pulling out the femur. Because he's of like, course he oh, does. I hit a tree root. And I was His like, his claim to fame. Sorry. Your phone? Yeah, my bad. His claim to fame, yes. Uh he talks about he's like and then i hit a tree root and i went no i've heard this story <laughs> and you should have seen zach like whoa with the femur <laughs> anyway so i wanted to add um that now the house has signs like one of them says trespassers will be drugged and buried in the yard oh like, shit they clearly lean into this pretty hard sure um there's also a lot of creepy signs that say like she did it it's not me the house's fault and i'm like ew, ew. ew. it's all pretty creepy um, so they talked about how the leathery material is human skin and all that stuff. Uh, now they talked about something that I had not heard of, which I think is so fascinating. And I began, I started reading into it. Do you know about the stone tape theory? Oh, not enough to, to like, not enough to riff with you, but I have heard of it. It's super fascinating. Cause like, I, I think I was planning on doing a whole story on it. So, well, so it's, it's the idea that, um, that would be really interesting. It's basically the idea that ghosts and hauntings are analogous to tape recordings and that here, I'm just going to read it. And that mental impressions during emotional or traumatic events can be projected in the form of energy and quote unquote recorded onto rocks and other solid items and Mm -hmm. then replayed under certain conditions. So the idea is basically in this context is that the wood floor underneath, like where the bodies had decomposed is they kept the wood floor. That's the same floor. They never replaced it. Jesus. And so... Uh, so it's still s- covered in... It still has absorbed a bunch of really awful fluids and stuff Yes, there. the putrefied fluid, fluids were Great. in the... And the stairs are the original stairs where the bodies had originally been dragged down. And so kind of Zach brought it up as like, oh, if you think about the stone tape theory, the idea is like this... All these solid objects have like absorbed this Energy trauma. to them, yeah. And can now like project it and replay it essentially so i thought that was super interesting um and another creepy thing they mentioned was that apparently things calmed down when she was arrested and put in jail for like those many years that she was in jail okay and then apparently the year she died things just went like crazy it's like she went back home right Mm. you just gave me chills thank you and the woman who lived there her name's peggy holmes she uh she's in her 90s and she talked to zach um early in the episode and she said she she's like oh after i talked to you 
like a week and a half ago, things started picking up. And he's like, what do you mean? He's like, and she said, after I talked to you, uh, the night after I woke up in the middle of the night and Dorothea was standing in my room. Good night. And he was like, wait, what? (laughs) And he's like, after talking to me? And she's like, yeah, after I called you guys and explained the whole story of the house and how I feel like she's, I sense her presence. uh, Then I woke up and she was standing there. And I was like, and this is a good episode, guys. Seriously, watch it. Um, And she was basically saying like, she was standing there in a yellow dress with big black stains all over it. Like dried blood. Yeah, or right. something, or yeah, just dark. Putrefied liquids. Or putrefied body fluids. And she said she was smiling, but not with her eyes. And that was how people always described her as like, she always seemed so happy-go-lucky, but like she was so sinister and nefarious. Yeah. Yep. Um, and so she, she said after that, in the last week and a half, she's like, this is the first time ever since living here, I've started feeling like I'm being pushed, like when i'm on the stairs Weird. like when i'm walking down the hallway i keep feeling like Look, I'm the being second pushed. You, you met you mentioned zach spirits go a little bananas uh-huh uh-huh yeah, <laughs> yeah. well yep that seems to be the case and uh so they the first thing that happens is they have this uh recorder and they're asking her like well what do you what would you want to ask her if you if you could ask her something and she said why are you here and why me and right. then they played it back like five minutes later and you can literally hear it go why are you here and then you hear to die and then you hear, why me? And it just says, you're dead. What? That's <laughs> so creepy. Like you would have been the next victim if I could have done something yeah, about like, it. Yeah, like I'm here to fucking get rid of you too. This is my house. So of course at this point, Zach is like, we want to banish your ass out of this house. Direct, uh-huh. direct quote. Direct quote. From Said from his biceps only. So, <laughs> it was tattooed. He just flexed and we all saw it. <laughs> it danced. He made it dance. Listen, I love the episode. I'm not going to stop making fun of it. Okay. Uh, they also brought in this couple who I would love for you to do a story on too someday. Their names are Michael and Marty Perry. Do you know them? I don't think I've never heard of them before, but uh, are they psychics? They're psychics. Yes. Um, they're psychics. And I believe they're a couple. Uh, and basically what they, I think I know who they are. Oh yeah. Um, but I think, so are they like a couple that Zach regularly has on the show? Probably. I don't watch it. Did one of them, was the woman, uh, like have like more like dark features, like brown hair, brown eyes, kind of like a, looked like she was from Jersey. She was blonde, I think, but maybe she dyed it. I don't know. There's one there's one f- psychic couple that he always had on his show that actually you should cover in a <gasps> Were they scam artists? No. They were murdered? The husband murdered the <gasps> wife. Oh fuck. After being on many episodes together of Ghost Adventures. <laughs> Holy shit. Like Zach knew them very well. Like they were like very good friends of his. I'm just saying if you wanted like the ultra paranormal true crime story. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Are you oh looking it up god. right now? Oh my god. Yeah, Ghost Adventures couple Mark and Oh, Debbie. Debbie. Okay, it wasn't my Okay. What, what was couple. the ones I said? You said M- Michael or Michael and Marty. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, I remember <gasps> That's terrifying. Yeah, it was really bad. Okay, so now we both have a story. Great. We should do a double psychic episode. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Um yeah, wow, that's wow okay chilling yeah. horrifying i'm so sorry about that uh yeah i did not know i about thought this. you were going to talk about them and i was and then you're like you should cover them and i was like oh, you you're don't like, even That's know your job, <laughs> I was like, actually you don't even know like christine you don't know what you're saying which usually i don't but yeah sorry the, the couple Mar- mike and marty okay. yeah uh, so mike and marty are this couple and what they do it's like really interesting so she'll be in another room and she'll draw she's like i get things as drawings and he will he will communicate and then they will like match up Oh, and see, compare their notes. And it is pretty wild, I gotta say. So what they did, he's like, we wanted, we flew them in to Sacramento. Did not tell them anything about where they were going. They literally blindfolded them and walked them into the house so they wouldn't see anything. Like, had them blindfolded in the car, all of it. They walked them in there and they said, okay, we're not going to tell you where we are, but we just want you to do kind of a, like... A scan. An assessment, right. And so he starts walking around. Um, oh my God, goose cam. He starts walking around. And he's like, huh. And he's kind of like weirded out in the kitchen. And he's like, what? What's going on? And he's like, I just feel like this is wrong. And he's like, what do you mean? He's like, this setup is wrong. And he's like, why? And he's like, there should be a wall here. And it's just like really weird. There's like the refrigerator is like four feet in front of him. He's like, there should be a wall here. And they're like, okay. And he kind of keeps wandering around. And he's like, they're like, is there anyone you're connecting to? And he's like, yeah, I'm seeing it through his eyes. He's like this huge man. He's really tall. He's like really massive and i'm getting the letters a b and so they're like like zach's face is going like oh my god oh my god and uh 
he's like, there's also a lady, but she's standing way back and she refuses to come near me huh. and does not want me to be here and does not want to communicate. And he's like, and I think this guy was murdered. And so I'm like, holy Oof. shit. So I'm listening. And AB, and I'm thinking, okay, AB, like the guy's name was Bert, who his real name was Alberto. Shut up. And so he's like, I can't tell if his name starts with an A or a B. And it was Alberto slash Bert was like his nickname. Alberto. Bert. <gasps> Yikes. And so then they bring in this lead detective and they're like, hey, has anything changed about this house? And he's like, well, yeah, they did some remodeling. There used to be a wall right here. And I just let everyone in the room was like, what? Like, it scam. scared the shit out of me. I was like, holy hell. Like, holy hell. And then and then, oh, God, the woman is drawing in the other room. She's like, I don't know. I picked up a couple people, mostly men, but then like this older woman and she's like kind of doing this weird smirk and they show it to the woman who lives there, Peggy. And she's like, she, what did she say? She said it's something like, well, sorry to say that's her. <laughs> and she's like, See, so matter of fact, she literally looked at it and she's like, and it had the same curls and everything in the glasses. And she's like, She's like, see, she's smiling, but not with her eyes. Yeah. And it was just the creepiest fucking thing. Ugh. And so anyway, I just loved it so much. It was so creepy. And then, of course, there's this whole thing where Zach falls out of a bed and says, I'm drugged. And I was like, OK, I can't watch this anymore. <laughs> but the rest of it was really good and really creepy. And uh, her house looks hella haunted. And I'm actually terrified. And they used um, a spirit box, the one that has all the names that come up. Like, oh, the, the words. Sorry, the obelisk. Yeah. And um, apparently they kept getting the word 15 because they said, oh, are you the victims? And they kept saying 15, 15. But there were only nine bodies found. And uh, so they were like, and then they got uh, six additional names. Okay. And they were like, oh, my God, maybe these are the six additional victims that nobody knows about. Wow. Because it adds up to 15. Right. And they kept getting 15 on two different ones in different parts Crazy. of the house. Crazy. And then they asked to Betty, like, where are your arms and your head? Like, where's the rest of your body? And she kept, she wrote, or it said east, east. And they Ooh. kept getting east. And then it said dig. And then it said cement and i was like <gasps> i'm and, out of here and that was where they just threw cement down right uh, the concrete over the yeah. roses it yeah. was just beyond me i i just was like so horrified and they never found her body parts so who's to say but <sighs> anyway that was a long one i'm so sorry but i just i started it a couple weeks ago and went this is a lot this is a lot more than i thought i thought it was gonna be a pretty basic story but then with the ghost stuff right and all this bullshit like Ended up being longer than expected, but I have had a, quite a few requests of that. And now that we're going to Sacramento, wow. I thought. I mean, that was a good one. And maybe that's where you go when you're going early. Oh, great. Yeah. I can't wait. <laughs> now I have something weird to do. There's even a bunny statue outside of a, a full grown man in like a bunny costume, kind of like, like Don, Donnie, Donnie Darko. Darko. And Zach literally walked up and was like, okay, for, guys, first I have to check if like there's a person in there. And they're like, wasn't, but it <laughs> just stands outside the house. Anyway. Super creepy. Sorry. So that was my hella long story. I'm so sorry about how long that was, but. Anyway, thank you guys for enduring that. Thank you. Both of those. Uh, I guess that's it. I mean, you know where to find us and that's why I drink.com. And we're traveling all over the place. So come see us live. Please buy tickets. We would like to have as many sold out shows as possible so we can brag to our moms so they can brag to <laughs> so our grandparents. Can, yeah, that's all we want. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And that's why we drink. <laughs>